You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Reproductive psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to. Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so they may experience physical and emotional well-being and find joy in motherhood. Please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I'm also mom to three kids of my own. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. So I'm going to remind you throughout the show, you are welcome to call in and ask any question you may have live on air. Number is 866-451-1451. And today we are welcoming Michelle Hamburger, who she's a wife, she's a mom, she's got two kids. She is also the executive director of the Francis Hamburger Institute, um, which is for rheumatoid arthritis and suffer and she suffers from two autoimmune diseases, which she's going to tell us about. Um myasthenia gravis and psoriatic arthritis and you know we're going to talk about the fact that being diagnosed with an autoimmune disease especially as a woman not so easy it's a pretty frustrating process i think navigating this system can be difficult you know if you're lucky and lucky i'm really putting this in quotes right you have super classic Hmm. symptoms You see the internist, they send you to a rheumatologist, they do the right labs, you have the right finances, and all goes smoothly. But that doesn't always happen. Um, And instead, it can be an incredibly frustrating, incredibly isolating process that where you have to really advocate for yourself in such a profound way, because people don't always take symptoms seriously, and it can take a lot of digging, and we're going to talk about that. I will say very quickly, I'll give a quick personal anecdote. A lot of my listeners know, you know, I have diabetes, and um, I have a really super rare autoimmune disease called um, adult-onset mastocytosis, plus some other ones. And there was a point where I had not been diagnosed with anything yet, and I saw this doctor, and I had just gone skiing, which is, like, my favorite thing in the whole wide world to do. Like, I would ski the day before I like on my deathbed I will go skiing and this doctor who had frankly had uncovered all these abnormalities on labs looked at me and he was like oh you have a goggle tan and I was like yeah we just went skiing he goes oh well then you you can't really be sick because none of my patients can go skiing and he dismissed me right there out of his office I was like but like what? Because I really didn't feel that. Like I, you know, I didn't want to be sick. I wanted to be healthy, but I knew there was something amiss. And at the time, part of the issue was I couldn't get pregnant, and I knew there must be something wrong. But that was it. He was like, "Well, you can't, you can't be skiing and be there." And it was so frustrating, and I felt so alone. And I felt like he was basically saying I was not telling the truth. And I think that can be a really common experience for people, which is so unfortunate. So, anywho, Michelle is here, and she's going to tell us not only about her own experience, but also about 
her institute, which is working incredibly hard to make the patient experience better, to make the whole process and to make the medical world around rheumatoid illness, as well as others, better. So welcome. Thank you so much, Carly, for having me on your show today. I'm so excited and grateful to be here. And it's it's really interesting because as you talk about your story, we are huge skiers. The more skiing we can do, the better. So we definitely (laughs) are one on that front. Um, And when I got diagnosed with my second, well, it's actually really my third, which is very telling because I actually have three autoimmune diseases. I have Hashimoto's. They come in in threes. They, they apparently they do. It's like dominoes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I forget about the Hashimoto's because right now it's just kind of under control. And that actually I got after having my my second child. I had postpartum thyroiditis, which Hashimoto's. So, um, but when I was so then I was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. But then I was skiing at uh, about two years ago, and I was at the top of the mountain, and I started seeing double. Um, and I, I, you know, I, it was then it was, it was pretty scary, you know, seeing double, yeah. not alone, you know, not let alone the fact I'm literally, <laughs> I had just, I had just, I had just said goodbye to my family and I was going to go see by myself with an instructor. And I, I was so excited. And all of a sudden there were two instructors. So oh my God. Uh, it was, it was, it was scary and it didn't go away. Um, and then obviously the journey to get diagnosed was. It takes a really long time to diagnose any of these diseases. And it is very scary and very lonely. And people look at you and they say, but you look fine. You Mm -hmm. look great. Like if I hear that one more time, like, thank you. I'm so glad I look great, but I feel often not so great. And as a woman going to the doctor and trying to figure out what was wrong with me, you know, I, I, had really bad fatigue also. And so mentally I was really frustrated. Um, I'm not gonna say I was clinically depressed, but being sick is depressing, let's be honest. Yes. Um, and not being able to function as a mother of two and you know, someone who's very active is really upsetting. I got told by multiple doctors that I should go on antidepressants and they kind of just, they didn't take me seriously. So I, I completely relate to that story of you can ski, you, you're fine. Um, it was so, so infuriating at the time. I remember thinking, wow, you're an ass. Like, it was uh-huh. the only thing that came into my head was like, wow. If I actually in my head, I remember thinking, if I was a man, would you be saying the same thing to me? Well, I was I was thinking the same thing, and I really think the answer is no. I don't think they would say the same thing. So no. I think that that's a big problem, and it makes it so much more lonely, um, and it just it's so, so much more shameful and terrible as a woman in this situation. Mm-hmm. Because it's that whole. That whole fit, even the the complaint of fatigue in some ways goes back to that notion of like um, women being hit, you know, that histrionic woman, Uh uh, which is so not a legitimate caricature, right? Like it's just, but that image that is this shameful image. So the idea of saying I'm tired. And, and that bone fatigue, right? It's not, it's not tired like I didn't get enough sleep last night. No. It's tired no, no. like it's you like really tired, can't like pull you can't it together. Move. Mm-hmm. Right. You can't. You know, when, and you don't have a choice. It's, yeah. It's just, it it's hurts. not, it's, it's, and I think, I think fatigue is one of the big, the big, the big symptoms because a lot of autoimmune diseases have fatigue as a symptom and a lot of doctors don't really, they don't know, they can't they can't medically necessarily solve it. And so they dismiss it. Yeah. I I always find that when I am not feeling great, if I go for a run, I, and I'm, I'm a decent runner, but I can't run as well. I I basically walk more than I run and my joints hurt. And it's like a telltale sign. It's like nuts. That's a bad thing. And it's everything goes downhill from that point because my energy, everything goes. And, you know, what's problematic is our healthcare system doesn't make time for discussion. Obviously right now, COVID is a whole different, right? Like 
because of COVID, no one's going to the doctor, right? This is a whole different world. But even, you know, but pre-COVID even, right? Unless you are seeing a private doctor and you're paying to have that 45-minute visit, even then, but, you know, you don't have the opportunity to really go through your your symptoms. How did you finally get appropriately diagnosed? Because also, myasthenia gravis, not the most common thing. I mean, psoriatic arthritis is slightly more common. Hashimoto's, I mean, postpartum thyroiditis is actually something I screen for in my patients, not infrequently, because there's a lot of overlap with um, some, you know, it's a, um, it mimics postpartum mood disorders. So I always check for the yeah. antibodies, um, but it is not, it's com- it's more common than people realize, I guess is a way to say it. But myasthenia, not that common. How'd you end up no, getting it's not- your diagnoses? Well, I will, I love that you did the air quotes around lucky because, I am very, very lucky. Um, I have really good medical insurance, which, you know, makes, and it's still hard, let's be honest. It's still very expensive. I have access to amazing doctors. My father-in-law is a rheumatologist in New York, and he's very active in the community, and so he has lots of connections. And I was you know, I, I I am lucky to have personal relationships with some of my doctors, which makes a huge difference, fortunately huge. and unfortunately. I mean, it makes a huge difference. So basically, it was <clears throat> about, a, I mean, six, eight months process to get diagnosed. I came home. I ruled out stroke. I ruled out brain tumor. We ended up, you know, I my ANA is obviously high. Um, you know, I had my advised test done at Exogen to rule out lupus. They thought I might have lupus. I had a full body scan to rule out MS. And then, so what actually had happened before I went skiing was I, I get migraines. I'm a migraine sufferer as well, although they've gotten better as I've gotten older. And so I used to take a shot of Amavig. And then I took a shot of Stelera, which is for psoriatic arthritis. And then I had Botox, yes, for vanity, and, uh, <laughs> but also for migraines. Um, and they think that the combination just, that obviously I was predisposed to have MG, but the combination had something to do with my, my cinea. So I ended up getting um, a test where they put needles and test how your muscles are working in your face and in your arms, Ouch. and I couldn't pass that well, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as it sounds, and it does have a name, but I'm just not remembering what the name is called. Um, and I, I did not pass that test, which that is a, that's a test for myasthenia. And I had to go back later for, you know, after six months to make sure it wasn't just the Botox. Because, you know, actually, as much as I don't want to say this, because, I, I mean, I wish I, Botox makes me look terrific. Um, <laughs> it, it, there are some negative, negative effects medically and you know you can you can come out looking like you have myasthenia after you have botox and then it goes away but mine didn't go away and my symptoms didn't go away um so it was concluded that i had myasthenia i went to lots of different doctors and had lots of different tests and you know i was really lucky that i had access to all of that um, I spend a lot of time thinking and something we're, de- we're looking at with the foundation is all of the people that are struggling and suffering with these diseases and don't have access to the doctors. They can't afford the diagnostics. They can't afford the prescriptions. These prescriptions, these diseases are so expensive. Um, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. Um, I think last I think last year it was you know 160 billion dollars was wow. spent on rheumatic disease, um, you know, and they're not they're not just expensive in terms of what you think of like going to the doctor and paying the doctor and the medicine. It's also loss of loss of wages, loss of you know you, you need to find somebody to watch your kids when you go to the doctor. Um, mental illness that's a, it's such a big comorbidity with all of this. 
um, something that's, it, that's, it's, um, I mean, it's just also, the, as you said, it's the time, not to mention some of these new drugs are exorbitant. We have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network at iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking with Michelle Hamburger. And after the break, Michelle is going to tell us more about her journey and about her foundation. Don't go away. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Michelle Hamburger. And if you have a question, give us a call, 866-451-1451. So, you know, we, we've been talking about kind of the inherent frustrations and difficulties of having autoimmune diseases and, and having them accurately diagnosed and you know they are more common in women they are also um they do pop up postpartum fairly frequently and interestingly just for anyone listening what's very you know fascinating from as a physician i'll say and and as someone who sees a lot of women pregnant and postpartum during pregnancy it's not uncommon and in commerce you know it's, it's relatively common so what our bodies do is um, we downregulate our immune system because obviously, you know, a, an embryo fetus, a baby, they, it's a foreign entity and our body doesn't want to fight it. So it's really common that autoimmune diseases improve during pregnancy. Now, is that across the board? No, but it's fairly common that a woman who has an autoimmune disease will feel better during her pregnancy. Now, that's great. The problem is it's also fairly common that after the fact, she will have a rebound of this illness and it may get worse, which I will say my third pregnancy definitely happened now. Unfortunately, it's also common that a new autoimmune disease may pop up in in the postpartum period um, and, you know, either, you know, a thyroid problem like Michelle had, you know, other, other things pop up. Um, you know, the body is a really amazing, obviously, <laughs> amazing thing. And our immune system specifically does incredible things around, you know, the whole peripartum period. Uh, it, it's 
it's fascinating that in a time when we're meant to be taking care of another, you would think our bodies would realize that we need to be at our strongest. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, but, you know, it's also really difficult because the fatigue we were talking about gets compounded by the fact we're not sleeping. And that only worsens what is otherwise present in terms of autoimmune symptoms. So, you know, it's really important if you're a new mom and you are having um, really unexplained excessive fatigue, but also, you know, joint aches um, and rashes and, you know, mouth sores, any of these things that you talk about it with your doctor because it doesn't necessarily, you know, mean it's just because you're postpartum. That That is not an inherent component of the natural course of, of new motherhood. That could also have um, other reasons that can be treated. So I want to throw that out there. Anywho, moving on. Um, now, as a mom, how have you been able to navigate having autoimmune diseases i mean like we're talking about like it can really knock you down but you have two young kids how have you kind of juggled things well uh juggle is right um you know if if i'm being really honest it's sometimes it's really hard um it's hard because, you know, I, I have two kids. I have a daughter who's in 10th grade, so she's 15 and a half. And I have a son who is in sixth grade and he is 11. Um, and it's being a mom is what I do. And so I really, I do my best to, what I do is I'm, I'm better in the morning and I know it. And I only have a certain amount of energy to use, kind of like a battery. And when it's out, it's out. And my symptoms are very unpredictable. So there are times when I just have to shut it all down. But I basically just prioritize them. So if that means, and it's, and it's exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about pregnancy. You know, your body prioritizes the baby and it forgets about you, kind of. Or at least that's what it felt like when I was pregnant. Um, and so, you know, that's what I do. I prioritize them as best as I can. I take it one day at a time. Um, and I also, you know, I think they, they're they old enough, at, at least thank God, where there's a lot of things they can do themselves. And so I promote independence, which helps all of us, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they see me as a human. But there's also a messy part of it because, you know, they're really sick of me being sick. And I think... Oftentimes they're resentful of that and I give them space for that because I understand it sucks. Can I it ask does a suck. question? Yeah. In. Of I, course. We I love that. Thank you. I have a question for both Michelle and you, Dr. Snyder, both of your takes on it. Sorry, I'm on a walk right now. Um what is what I would love to hear both of your um your opinions on is how do you best navigate when you're dealing with sort of a persistent disease or ailment, obviously in this case, autoimmune disease with children? How do you talk to them about it? Let them in on it? Obviously, it's age dependent. Michelle's kids are at an age where they understand. But while also dealing with it yourself, knowing that it isn't, you know, it isn't a cold, it isn't a sore throat, something that's going to go away in a few days. So how do you you know, how do you, how do you bring them into the conversation without having it take over? Um, knowing like what Michelle does is she prioritizes her kids. She uses her best time of day to really be with them and be active with them. And then the downtime when she can, and then from the doctor's perspective, you know, what's your take on sort of how to keep the, the family unit healthy when the mom, who's obviously in most cases, sort of the glue of the unit dealing with this ongoing, um, really, intense situation. Um, what are both of your sides on this? Such an incredibly great question. Michelle, you want to take that first? Sure. Um, you know, I happen to be a really probably too honest person. And so I have educated them about what's going on with me. And I, you know, I just keep reiterating that I'm going to be okay. I'm not, 
I'm not dying. You know, my, my sister-in-law had breast cancer last year, which was really scary and terrible and thank God she's okay. But, you know, I, I, I reiter, I, I tell them like, I'm safe. I'm fine. I'll be okay. It's a moment in time. Um, I think that's the biggest thing I do because I don't want them to be scared that something's going to happen to me because of these diseases. Um, I also, I, I'm also honest about it. Like I, I really, I, I always just try to do the best I can and that's really all I can do. And sometimes that means that it's okay not to be okay. Like I don't always have to be okay if I'm not okay. Um, that's not realistic, those expectations. So I think setting really good expectations and having an open line of communication with them is really, really important. I also make sure that they're always taken care of. So if I know that I'm having a treatment and I can't be available, I make sure that they're both accounted for, they get where they need to go. They're both involved with sports and, and different things. And, you know, the support system that we've built around them is, very large and a big part of our lives. Uh, it's important to my husband and I that both kids have other adults that they trust and can count on, whether they're coaches or family friends or aunts or uncles or grandparents. And so, you know, they're never alone in this journey, which is important for. <clears throat> so I, I, I reiterate, I think that's all totally totally great and I think I would add um, especially when it comes to younger kids um, the notion that you know it's okay like Michelle was saying it's okay not to always feel okay that mommy will be okay you know kind of walking it through right like and making space for if mommy needs to lie down, maybe let's watch a movie together. Um, having that kind of discussion. Um, and kind of allowing for that, um, that kind of freedom to talk about what they're feeling about it. Is that... Make sense? Yeah, thank you guys so much. That was great. Yeah, I think the only other thing I would say is kind of allowing the kids to also f talk about, like, like when mom isn't feeling good, how do they feel about it? Because I think sometimes they get scared but get worried about worrying, worrying about mom, if that makes sense. But letting kids say, I'm angry about this or I'm sad about this or whatever it is. Right. But giving them kind of the space to have emotional experience about their mom's experience without getting worried that it's going to hurt mom's feelings. Right. And, you know, mom actually saying, no, listen, it's okay for you to have those feelings. Like it's okay for you to be pissed off that I can't put you to bed tonight because I don't feel great. I get it. I'm pissed off about it too, but tomorrow night, yes. hopefully I'm going to feel better and I will put you to bed. Right. Like not, you know, because it's okay for the kid to have a negative response about it. Um, and, and letting, you know, letting kids know that like, as Michelle was saying, everybody has something. Um, and, you know, not necessarily saying this too shall pass because it may not pass, right? Like these are chronic illnesses, but saying that this episode will pass and this isn't something that one can necessarily fully control and that's okay. Um, but I think the biggest thing, especially with the younger kids, as I said, is just kind of giving room for emotional responses. Yeah, but awesome question. Thank you so much for calling. My pleasure. And Thank how you. Does, how does you, the foundation relate to it? And is well, able we, to sort of really impact autoimmune disease and getting in and 
really making a difference in this area. So, you know what? We are going to take a break, but after we get back, we are going to answer that question. So you're listening to MD for Moms and the BBM Global Network, iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center. And after the break, Michelle Hamburger is going to answer that very question of what the Francis Hamburger Institute does. Stay with us. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale, an international initiative called Nurse Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the veteran folk-style wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Michelle Hamburger of the Francis Hamburger Foundation. And just before the break, we got a very excellent question about what the Hamburger Foundation does to you yeah. know, better the patient experience and you know for room, rheumatologic illness. So what does it do? So what it does. So the Francis Hamburger Institute for Community Rheumatology was started in 2017 um, after it was named after and dedicated to my late mother-in-law, Francis Hamburger, who was actually a PhD in, she was a therapist. Um, and she actually passed away, not from a rheumatic illness, but from CJD. I don't know if you know anything about that. Oh, it's yeah, I do. Disease. Yeah, that's a um, very rare, but awful. A very, disease. very rare. Probably, I watched my dad in three years die of lung cancer, which was obviously horrendous. This was uh, probably one of the worst things I've ever seen. She was diagnosed in February and then passed away in March, and it was, it was, it was bad. But um, do they even know how she, she got away, it? Not to divert um, the discussion, but so I know, right? It's a whole that's a whole other episode. Um, they don't know for sure anything. Uh, the assumption is that maybe thirty five to forty years prior she was in Europe and ate meat that was bad. Um, wow. and then you know c j g lays it can lay dormant in your yeah. body for up to forty years, and then all of a sudden it just comes out, and it's very hard talk about hard diagnosis. Um, but so awesome. we, uh, we, we at this time aren't doing any prion research. I'm not going to shut the door on that completely, but Fran suffered from rheumatic disease all of her life. She had ankylosing spondylitis and it significantly <sighs> impacted her quality of life. She was a skier also and a horseback rider and eventually couldn't do the things she loved to do anymore because of her rheumatic disease. She also was married to my father-in-law, who's, as I said, he's a rheumatologist. He's a practicing rheumatologist. And at some point when they figured out that being a doctor 
didn't financially support their lifestyle, they began to look for ways to support rheumatologists and um, they founded a company called United Rheumatology. And so she basically dedicated the last 10 or 15 years of her life to working with rheumatologists and in the rheumatology field to help improve patient care and life for rheumatologists. So when she passed away, we wanted to start something that honored her, her life and carried out her life's work. And so the Francis Hamburger Institute was created. Um, I actually, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't start it. My father-in-law called me and told me that he wanted me to be the executive director because when she was, um, very sick. I came to New York and helped with her end of life care. And he was like, you're really competent and amazing. Like you need to be doing something big. And I was doing something big. I was raising his grandchildren. <laughs> um, but, but so he asked me to do this and I wasn't really sure I wanted to, frankly, my background's in forensics and I, I didn't know how to do it, and I hadn't yet been diagnosed with any of these diseases, so my buy-in wasn't huge. But as life happens, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in fate, um, I ended up the executive director, and I ended up then getting diagnosed with a bunch of different diseases that were very relevant. So I was able to talk to, you know, I went through the patient journey, so I know all about it and how hard it is. And so the foundation... Um, is dedicated to carrying out initiatives, education, and research that help to raise awareness and provide insights to improve treatment, access, uh, quality of life, time to diagnosis for rheumatic patients and autoimmune patients. So that is our mission and what we do. And we had, you know, one of the things that's really interesting as a patient and also as the executive director with the opportunity to speak to many, many. So all of our initial funding, which is kind of interesting, came from rheumatologists, which doesn't usually happen in these kinds of charities. And so I've, I've had access, to, you know, to speak to lots of different practicing rheumatologists, um, you know, in the nation. And you kind of get the same idea no matter where you sit. There's no collaboration. Everything is completely siloed. You know, I go to five different doctors for one disease, one disease that impacts lots of different organs in my body. Um, they don't love to work together. Um, you know, I have three different neurologists. One deals with my eyes, one deals with my myasthenia, and another one deals with my headaches. That's insane and hard to navigate. Mm -hmm. And you sit, sit and you talk you talk to pharma and they're like, oh, it's the payers that are doing it wrong. And this is why the system is terrible. Or you talk to the payers and they say it's, it's pharma and the doctors. And so one of, one of our goals at FHI is stakeholder collaboration because in order to really move the needle and to make the patient experience better, we got to work together. And does everyone buy into that? Well, they actually did buy into that, which was quite amazing. So our first event that we held was a stakeholders round table, and it was actually supposed to be in New York in March. And I flew into New York to go and, you know, for our event and it got canceled because of COVID 24 hours before. Um, and we had, we had stakeholders from all the different areas. So we had physicians, we had payers, we had patient advocacy folks, government policy, diagnostics, um, experts in healthcare, data science, biomedical innovation, mental health professionals. Um, and the idea was for everybody to sit in a room together. It, it did end up happening virtually and get over the fact that everybody wants to make money everything's very expensive. And this is, I mean, this is big business and really focus back on the patient and work together to align, align our incentives so we can support research and initiatives that actually help the patients. And we really can't do that in just, with just using one stakeholder. It really takes everybody and in order to make a difference 
for the patient. So how from a medical standpoint, right? Because as you said, you have like the doctor for this, the doctor for that. And in fairness, there is the subspecialized training and treatment, right? Like the headache doctor can't treat your eyes. Like mm-hmm. you don't want the headache doctor to treat your eyes and vice like No, you don't. You don't you surely don't want the psychiatrist treating your eyes because as a psychiatrist I can say you don't want me looking and dealing with your eyes. Um, but you don't want your eye doctor treating your anxiety. Um, that being said, there's something beautiful about the, you know, the collaborative care models and the models where everything is in the same um, locations, you know, like where the patient can say, I have an appointment at 10, 11, 12 in the same building and I don't have to deal with it beyond that one afternoon, for example, right? Rather than my entire right. life is taken up being a professional patient because I have constant appointments every week with different doctors and such. How did you guys kind of come up, if at all, like with kind of a model from the medical perspective? Because there is no way to kind of centralize that beyond location or time that's it's it's really a difficult a difficult question and answer in terms of from the medical perspective because you're right i don't you know there is a reason why you go to multiple specialists but i will tell you in terms of the collaborative care model it does work really well in other disease states and it's missing from this disease state and this is these these diseases we're stuck with forever. They're chronic. Mm-hmm. Some of them are degenerative. They're not going away. They're not acute. Um, and so I guess there, there's two answers. One, I dream of a collaborative care model for autoimmune disease where I, I told you earlier in another segment that my sister-in-law had breast cancer. Um, the, collaborative, the collaborative care model for breast cancer is outstanding. Um, it is, it, it makes having, going through that so much easier for the patient. And so, yes, I think in a lot of the work that we will do in the future, we'll look to push for that for autoimmune diseases. Um, but really collaboration among the stakeholders is the first step because we need each stakeholder to move the needle a little bit and we need them to do it together. Um, you can't just rely on one stakeholder. Um, and so having the round table bring these people together, I mean, a lot of these they've never been in the same room together ever. You can go to a conference every weekend on rheumatic disease and you won't find one that has everyone in the room together. And so it was a great first step to at least get everybody talking. And yeah, there was a little bit of arguing and a little bit of tension, but that was okay. We got over it and we came to some really amazing conclusions. So, like what, what did you guys just come up with? So one of, one of the, one of the big conclusions that we came up with that was that everything needed to be patient centered, which means that we were right, like we needed to go back to focusing on the patient and then the four areas, and then also understanding that this whole agenda got COVIDized, which apparently isn't a word, but it really it should be. be. Um, yeah. yeah, it should be. It got COVIDized because what COVID did was it accentuated the existing problems. You know, it, you basically, you stop seeing patients and That's a big problem for these chronic patients. So we COVIDized the agenda and came up with four areas that we're going to focus on, which were access, which is a big issue. Um, Access to care, access to quality care. um, there, There are big disparities in that. And then telemedicine, which is also a really big hot topic right now because if you can't get to the doctor, how do you see the doctor? And, you know, it really looks like there are going to be some portions of telemedicine that aren't going to go away. And that could be a good thing. It could also be a bad thing because there are people that can't, they don't have access to telemedicine. Uh, you need technology 
in order to be able to do that. So that's, that's a big problem. Um, and then the last two focuses that we, we spoke, uh, spoke about were mental health, which I talked about briefly earlier, but the comorbidity of rheumatic disease and mental health is high. And I, I think we just can't ignore mental health. I think if you treat mental health also, um, it's a win-win. And then the last one was cost, which is a gigantic issue. So yeah. I, do, I do believe that if we work together, we can make small dents in these gigantic issues that desperately need to be addressed. Well, it sounds like you guys did amazing work. Um, we have to take another brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Michelle Hamburger about autoimmune diseases and FHI from a you know, the patient perspective and from the executive director perspective. Don't go away. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. Yeah, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact a symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to Michelle Hamburger of the Francis Hamburger Institute. And just before the break, Michelle was telling us about the amazing roundtable, virtual roundtable that they had um, earlier this, I guess, spring, summer. Um, and it's, you know, it really sounds like there was a lot of progress made and that will be made in the you know near future that can really make a great difference for the patient experience. And will this, do you think it, the work that you guys are doing, will it be able to translate to other disease processes? I really think it will be able to translate. Um, I think that the problems we're dealing with, um, they're healthcare problems. It's not just rheumatic disease. Um, it's any disease. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. I think that there are some disease states that are further along in the process than autoimmune disease. And there are some diseases, disease states that are, you know, not as far along in the process. Um, we're looking to start a multidisciplinary cross collaborative task force to kind of analyze just that with the idea that we're stronger together. And if you look at other areas like HIV and oncology, they're so much further along in their collaborative care models. They're also further in law, further along in at least identifying healthcare inequities and access issues. 
Um, and so by creating a task force that incorporates different disciplines, we can learn from each other. And again, I say this all the time, but if we can just move the needle a little bit, we're winning because this is a big problem. We're not trying to cure anything. We're just trying to make the journey easier and better for patients and doctors. Which I would say, amazingly, you are um, unique in that, right? It's amazing that, maybe it's not amazing, but it is amazing to me that no one else that I know of is trying to do so. Um, um, yeah, I, I think that I think that being a patient myself and then being lucky enough and this time it's really lucky, being lucky enough to be able to talk to experts in all the areas from all the different stakeholder groups has really enabled us to be able to focus on that. Yeah, it's wonderful. I'm sure, you know, I think especially now where people's focus is actually not on things like, you know, chronic illness, I mean, people's focus is really on COVID, but the truth is that things like, you know, rheumatic illness, it's not like it's gone away, right? I mean, while obviously COVID is incredibly important and is taking lives every day, people who are suffering from, you know, various autoimmune diseases and HIV and cancer, they're still suffering from it. I mean, it's important to remember that these things have not disappeared from the landscape of medicine. Right. And so not, we still and not need to focus are on they, it. Are they still, they're still suffering from that. A lot of the medicines that we take, you know, compromise our immune system. So with COVID, it's like an added, the whole added layer of problems, which we don't need, but we're stuck with. So it's been an interesting an interesting series of events. Right. I mean, it, it is interesting also, there's a whole question of whether having an autoimmune disease or, you know, we, I guess it depends on comorbidities and what have you, whether or not there is an increased risk based on uh, whether you have uh an autoimmune disease, whether that increases COVID risk, if you actually do get COVID, um, in terms of severity and what right. have you, um, that's for a different day. Um, ultimately, that's wear a mask. Day, yeah. Wear a mask. Yeah. For everyone else's protection, yeah. stay inside. Don't put yourself at risk. Just treat it with the respect it deserves. Period. <laughs> now. Here's a, if there was one thing you can think of, and it's always hard to, you know, these questions are always hard, but I'll give it to you anyway. Um, if there's one thing you wish you knew, you know, or one thing that you learned by virtue of being a patient that you, you kind of wish you knew before becoming sick, what would it be? Um, oh, one thing. I... I think I think it's it's really I don't know that's really hard one thing um I don't know it's so hard to boil it down to one thing I guess I guess I would be okay to not be okay is a big one because just kind of acceptance is, has been a really p- important part of this journey for me um it allows me to give myself the love and care that I need um, as a human and then as somebody who suffers from chronic illness. Um, And just being okay with where I am, you know? And then I guess Mm -hmm. with a side of advocacy, I didn't realize, I didn't realize like how hard it was to get convinced people that I'm really going through what I'm going through. Well, that's, there's, always, there's also always that component of like 
screw them if they don't get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, on that pause you note, know, if people want right. to learn more about FHI, how can they find out? In our last brief moments together, how? What is your website? So our website is www.francishamburgerinstitute.org, um, and Francis is with an E, and the hamburger is spelled just like the food. Um, again, www.francisinstitute.org, and there are lots of there's lots of information on that site, and you'll be able to read about the round table. We'll be publishing multiple papers. Um, might even be some snippets to listen to, although it's four hours long, so kind of a long <laughs> listen. And people can donate there as well, I imagine, if they are so Absolutely. Ab absolutely. Donations are always welcome. Good. And there's uh, on the website to do that. Excellent, because it's always a great thing to donate. Donate, donate, you know. Good cause. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a great hour. I've really enjoyed talking to you. This is awesome. Well, thank you to our listeners. Remember, if you missed any of this show, you can always download it as a podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app, along with prior episodes. Join us every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern on iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, or, or BoldBraveMedia.com. This has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Until next time, be well, enjoy life, wear a mask, please, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.